<laughs> oh goodness. Now I now I'm not gonna be scared of cicadas, all these cicada pictures. No, I'm like, no, no fear. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> hi guys, it's live science. We are live, obviously. Um, <laughs> with me, I have Mindy Weisberger, senior writer for Live Science and our obvious cicada beat. And uh, she's gonna be talking about the brood X cicadas today. And uh, so Mindy, take it away. Tell me about these brood X that I am terrified to see in my backyard. Yeah, uh, yes. Well, okay. Well, first of all, uh, all right, brood X is, is brood X is something that you, that you um, may have been hearing about, seeing uh, seeing around. Uh, it, it sounds like something out of a comic book, you know, brood X. But it's actually the X is you know the Roman numeral ten. So this is technically brood ten, which is a population of periodical cicadas, which are the cicadas with black bodies and red eyes that come out in cycles of either 17 years or 13 years, depending on the species. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so brood, brood 10 or brood X uh, is one of these, is one of these populations, one of these broods. Uh, these, these types of cicadas are different from the annual cicadas, which have green bodies and come out at the end of every summer, usually around August. Uh, periodical cicadas, they, live underground for, for either 17 or 13 years, and then they come out in waves and waves in the millions and billions. And, uh, and that is what we are seeing now with, with brood 10. So this is also known as the Great Eastern Brood. So this is the most widespread of all the broods. So this, uh, they, they come out over 15 states uh, in the spring, in uh, May, late May into June. And, uh, and, but unfortunately, Judy, you will not be seeing them in Brooklyn. <laughs> they do not. They do not. They do not. They do not come out in Brooklyn. Um, I'm in New Jersey, and uh, I'm actually fairly close to New York City, and uh, we're not. You know, we're not seeing them at all here where I am. Uh, I actually went uh, went to Princeton over the weekend to look for the brood ten cicadas, and uh, was able to find them there. But no, they are not. Unfortunately, they are not. Not in New York City. There was. A, I think there was. A, there was a brood ten population on Long Island, but I. I think I, I think it's ex it would not extinct, but it's I, but I think that population is gone by now. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, I hear sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> this is this is Mindy's content that she shot this weekend. Oh my god, they're terrifying. Yeah. So what you're so what you're seeing right there. Oh my god, it's so cool. So that is actually uh, and what is that? What that is is that's in uh, the metamor the metamorphic stage where an adult is emerging from the exoskeleton of the nymph. Now the nymph is the stage that grows underground. And lives underground for uh, for seventeen or thirteen years, and then uh, then once it climbs out of the ground, it uh, climbs the first vertical thing that it can find, usually a tree, and then the adult emerges. And when it comes out, as you saw in the video before, it's kind of white and squishy. And um, but uh, but then after it fully emerges, uh, then the uh, its exoskeleton uh, hardens and turns black, and you can see it has the the very distinctive red eyes, which mm -hmm. are just. So beautiful, so beautiful up close. And here's the uh, the live. This is this is a uh, footage from the live cicada cam. Yes. So so if if like Judy, you live in Brooklyn or someplace else now. Now even though this this brood is very widely distributed across the northeastern U.S., uh, maybe you don't have cicadas near you, uh, but. The Discovery Channel has a live cicada cam, so you can actually watch these cicadas. And this is in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and they will have this camera up. Uh, it'll be rolling 24/7 between uh, from from now through May 30th. So, and you can find it on the Discovery Channel website, on their Facebook and YouTube channels. We'll include those links for you here. So if, if you are unfortunately not in, uh, not someplace where you can just go outside and see all of these, uh, all of these cicadas firsthand, that is where you can see them. Gross. <laughs> no, 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 they're amazing. <laughs> I do recall as a kid going out and finding the exoskeletons and putting mm -hmm. it on my shirt like it was a brooch. Oh. Speaking speaking of which, I actually have one here that that is fresh fresh from Princeton. Let me see if uh, there's enough light to actually see it. Oh, wow. So this is yeah. So this uh, this is just like the empty. Whoop, there it is. So this is like just the empty husk of the nymph, and the adult emerged from this in its white squishy form, and uh, and then hopefully uh, hopefully before it was eaten. <laughs> By by something, uh, it uh, it turned you know Texas skeleton turned black and climbed up the tree and it may still be there today. I don't know, but 
but yeah, there there were so many of these because they because when these when these cicadas come out, they come out in these very very dense swarms of uh, in in some in some places it's uh, it's like about a, a million or more per acre. It's yeah, a lot. reasons I'm terrified. <laughs> oh. But there's so many reasons you shouldn't be terrified because they're really cool and interesting. And actually, we have a video mm -hmm. that can tell you all the things that are so cool about these cicadas. So why don't we take a look at that? Red-eyed brood 10 cicadas will soon be visiting the eastern U.S. for the first time in 17 years. These black-bodied insects are periodical cicadas, and they live underground for nearly two decades. They're cousins to annual cicadas, which have green bodies and appear in the U.S. every year during late summer. Certain periodical cicadas follow a 13-year cycle. Some, like 2021's Brood 10, emerge every 17 years. Periodical cicadas are grouped into numbered broods, based on when and where they emerge. Their lives as adults only last four to six weeks, and they spend most of their time singing and mating. As there are so many of them, their singing can get pretty loud, up to 100 decibels. That's about as loud as an outboard motor, a jackhammer, or a jet taking off. Cicadas lay their eggs high up in the trees where they mate. Six weeks later, their eggs hatch, the nymphs fall to the ground and burrow into the soil, and the cycle starts all over again. Periodical cicadas are harmless, but numerous. In some regions, they can emerge in the millions. Brood 10 is one of the largest and most widely distributed broods, and cicadas will appear in 15 states, as far west as Illinois, as far east as New York, and from northern Georgia to southern Michigan. And now joining us is our special guest, Elizabeth Barnes, who is an entomology educator at Purdue University in Indiana. Elizabeth, thanks for coming here today. Happy to be here. <laughs> so, uh, okay, yeah, so tell me, um, so, so Indiana is actually, um, although this, uh, this brood is distributed across 15 states in Washington, DC, Indiana is one of the states that is seeing the most coverage of, uh, of these cicadas. So yeah, so what can you tell us about uh, what you're seeing in Indiana right now and at Purdue, uh, Purdue in particular? Um, we've been seeing them start coming up all over the state. Uh, I actually, yesterday or the day before, we started getting our first reports of them emerging in northern Indiana. So the whole state has the opportunity to see the cicadas now. Um, on Purdue campus itself, um, the the main campus here in West Lafayette has been kind of, you know, we've had too much construction over the years, so there aren't many cicadas there. But we have a research forest nearby, Martell Forest, uh, and we've seen lots of cicadas there. I went out a few days ago and we could hear them start chorusing. It was it was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> okay, so yes. so what are some of what are some of the best types of places to look for cicadas if you want to go see them? Basically think about where are the oldest trees near where you are. Um, the cicadas really need to be feeding on tree roots for the, the full 17 years when they're underground. So if you take away the trees, you lose the cicadas. Um, so if you if you go to those areas, a lot of times um, state parks are great places to go or um, even local city parks sometimes. Uh, I, I know someone who was driving around in Indianapolis with their windows down, just listening for them and she said, that the areas that were kind of the oldest neighborhoods in Indianapolis, she heard the most cicadas. So that might be a place to look to. Wow. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so, so, um, you know, some, some people are going to, you know, are going to find cicadas, you know, in their neighborhoods, um, maybe in their own backyards. Uh, because cicadas come out in such large numbers, uh, should people be worried about their pets eating the cicadas? <laughs> For the most part, no, not at all. Um, cicadas, they're, they don't bite, they don't sting, they're not poisonous. Um, the only real kind of potential trouble you might have is first off, if the cicadas have been treated with some sort of insecticide or, or something like that has contaminated them and then your pet eats them, you might have some issues there. The second thing is that their exoskeleton is actually really difficult to digest. So your pet might throw up if they eat a whole bunch of them. Um, so what we've been telling people is, is basically, you know, don't freak out if your pet eats them. Um, I, I fully expect my cat will go after one if she's able to encounter one when I let her out on the porch. Um, 
But at the same time, if you notice they start acting off, they seem sick, definitely consult a vet just to be sure. Okay. So, so what are, um, what are some of the, you, you mentioned that, you know, they're not, they're not toxic, they don't sting, uh, but you know, that, that people may have some misconceptions or ideas about what cicadas are that, uh, that are incorrect. So, so what are some of the common myths and misconceptions that people have about cicadas? I, I think the biggest one that I get, um, and it, it's worse here in the Midwest, is that people will use the word cicadas and locusts interchangeably, and they are not the same insect at all. They um, The cicadas have these piercing sucking mouth parts, so they will basically use a straw to drink liquid out of a tree, whereas a locust has chewing mouth parts, so they'll actually chew up um, crops and destroy the tissue of the crops. Uh, so cicadas, they, they look like these kind of basically giant leaf hoppers, whereas locusts are basically grasshoppers. Um, one feeds on trees, doesn't do that much damage when it is feeding on them. And then the other, which are the locusts, they do a lot of damage and they will do damage to the crops. So cicadas are not locusts. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't worry about that. They're not gonna kill your crops. They're not gonna kill most trees. It'll be fine. Yeah, I think a lot of people will be relieved to hear that. But um, but even though, even though cicadas don't eat trees or chew on them, they're, mm -hmm. they can still do some damage to some types of trees. Is that right? Yes, correct. Um, the cicadas have this organ uh, called an ovipositor, which is, it, it looks kind of like a giant needle and they use it to pierce tree bark and lay their eggs inside of the trees. Um, and when they do that, it can crack the bark. And on large trees, it looks really bad. You see all this little die off um, on the, the smallest branches and you think, oh no, is my tree dying? But it's really okay. It's basically like a light pruning. On smaller trees or very young trees, it can be more of an issue because um, sometimes those small branches are actually like major branches of the tree or the trunk of the tree. And so that's harder for them to lose and recover from. But most trees will be absolutely fine. Right. I think when I was in Princeton, the street that we parked on, there was uh, one of the trees that looked like it was kind of a young tree or recently planted tree in front of someone's house. They'd actually wrapped it in some kind of a netting, which, yes. I, which I think I think was you know possibly to keep the uh, to keep the cicadas off it. Yeah, yeah, that's actually uh, the the best way to protect your trees from cicadas if you do have young trees um, is just basically put this netting around it. It keeps the cicadas from getting access to the trees to, to lay their eggs on it. Um, it protects their trees. And there have been studies done that show it is, for most people, the cheapest way to protect your tree and the most effective way to protect your tree, even compared to all sorts of insecticides. Netting is really the way to go. So I, I know that a lot of people are excited to see Brood 10. I, I'm super excited about it, but, but for, yeah, for entomologists in particular, this must be just like the best year ever. So what are some oh, of the yeah. ways, yeah, so what are some of the ways that, that, that scientists are gonna be looking at Brood 10 and what are some of the things they hope to learn from them? The, the biggest effort for um, for research right now is really collecting location data about where the cicadas actually are. Um, because the last time that the cicadas were out for Brood 10, um, we were relying on people doing things like sending in reports to their county extension educator or there were researchers who were, again, driving around with their windows down, listening for cicadas, and that's how they were mapping them. And as you can imagine, that's really labor intensive. You don't get a lot of data points for it. Now, lots of people have smartphones that they can easily take pictures and get the GPS coordinates attached to that picture. Um, and so we can get really precise mapping of the emergence. There's two big places where people are doing that. First is um, Cicada Safari, which is a big cicada specific app. If you wanna just focus on the cicadas, that's the way to go. The second is you can use iNaturalist, which is a general biodiversity database. And that's also a great place to upload data. Um, and the reason that we actually care about this so much is uh, distribution data of organisms um, really underpins everything from genetics work to um, the sort of management recommendations that I was just talking about. Like, I wish I could tell people like, yes, there are cicadas in your area, you need to protect your trees, or like, don't worry about it, don't waste your money. And with these maps in the future, we should be able to do that. 
Yeah. So, so in addition to scientists being able to create these maps, just you know, be, mm -hmm. so that they can track the emergences, you know, in these thirteen mm -hmm. and seventeen-year cycles, this is also a way for, you know, people to contribute to the scientific effort just through their own observations. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it it's a great it's this massive community science program, um, and I I feel like it's a great way to kind of feel a, like you're involved and really contributing in a positive way. Um, yeah, that that map has been updating. That's an absolutely great map. I love <laughs> I it so love much. <laughs> so that's yeah. What we're looking at right now is a map uh, from uh, the University of Connecticut, and so so this is yeah. So this is pulling data from uh, I, I believe from Cicada Safari and uh, from from other uh, from other sources as well to uh, to try and and map in near real time where the emergences are being seen and where the populations are, dense, are densest. And one of the things that scientists will see from that is how well this aligns with what they know from where. Brew 10 was 17 years ago during the last emergence. So, so there, but there's a, there's another, there's another, actually, um, there is another organism that kind of piggybacks on this whole Brew 10 story uh, <laughs> that as, as, as crazy as it is that there, uh, that there are insects that live 17 years, uh, uh, live underground for 17 years, there is also a species of fungus that has a life cycle that matches that of these insects and that it, and they specifically infect these insects. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about the zombifying cicada fungus? <laughs> <laughs> um, th this is definitely one of those instances where when people hear about it, they tend to be like horrified and fascinated at the same time. Um, it, so with a lot of insects, um, they will have um, predators, parasitoids, a fungus that really specializes on them. So with this fungus, it is only growing on cicadas. Um, it infects the cicadas as they're coming out of the ground. Uh, it grows inside them until they have, it's completely replaced their abdomen um, with the fungus. That's that little white like nub at the end of the abdomen you're seeing in these pictures. Um, it, it creates all these bizarre chemical changes in the cicada's brain too, where it makes them much more active. Um, it can make them respond to um, um, sexual signals in different ways. For example, um, when male cicadas sing, um, other male cicadas will respond in the same way as a female by clicking their wings to attract that that uninfected male. It comes over, it tries to mate, and it gets infected with the fungus too. Um, and it, it can get to the point where the fungus has actually fallen off the back end of the cicada. And so you see this like half a cicada walking around acting like everything's totally fine and it's totally healthy. And you're staring at it and going like, Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. No, 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 no. Relax. Like rest a little bit. You are really sick. Um, you are not fine. You are no, very not fine. No. <laughs> um, and that's where that's where it gets this zombie cicada name, because it's sort of like the almost like the living dead of cicadas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, this is just it, it is it is equal parts horrifying and fascinating. And and just I actually and I the fact that I actually found one of these when when I was at a Princeton this weekend and it, it did it just flew it flew right into my leg. And I and I was like, Oh, that's you know, there's a cicada on me, how fun, how cute. And I pick it up and then I see the you know, I see this this whitish yellow mass at its back end and I like literally started like you know yelling at my family at this <laughs> and there was this there was this other family with two little girls in the field and I just start yelling, I found a zombie and I I and they were actually kind of fascinated too. So I like to think that that was maybe science education or <laughs> there was some educational for them. I hope there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So they didn't seem too traumatized. So, uh, okay. So, that, so I guess um, so. So, my last question is also just when we, when you're talking about insect emergences in these vast numbers. One, you know, there's there's a thing that insects do that maybe people don't think about too much, but you know, they pee and poop as as animals do. And when you have a, you know, potentially a million cicadas in an acre of you know, of land, that's a lot of pee and poop. So, what what are the environmental impacts of all of these you know all of these cicadas coming out at the same time and doing their business? Luckily, it, it shouldn't be too bad at all. Um, cicada pee is largely um, sugar and water just because they're they're drinking so much of the xylem. It goes through really quickly. Um, there's more than the cicadas need. Uh, you might actually, if you're standing under a tree with a lot of cicadas and you suddenly, it feels like it's raining, you're getting peed on by the cicadas, mm. unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, which is a lovely thought. Um, but... 
in terms of the environment, um, for the most part, it shouldn't have that big of an impact. In some areas, if you get a high enough concentration and if the pea has enough sugar in it, um, you might start to see the growth of something like sooty mold um, on the things that the, the pea has landed on. But don't worry, the cicada pea is not like the next big environmental disaster that we should be worried about. <laughs> Okay, well, that's that's good to that's good to know. Uh, okay, so uh, so Judy, I don't know if we've been getting any questions coming in while we've been talking. Oh my, yes, uh, <laughs> I have one here from Jordan on Facebook who says he actually lives outside of Purdue and hasn't seen a single one. So, do you have any suggestions uh, where he can actually find them, or maybe maybe the rolling down the windows driving kind of thing? Yeah, the, the rolling down the windows and driving is a great tip. Um, I would also say if you can go for a hike in Martell Forest, that's a great place right near Purdue. Um, but if you want to see the really big numbers, southern Indiana is the place to be, particularly around the Bloomington area. We've been seeing just really massive reports of cicadas. Um, and there are some wonderful state parks in that area too. So you can, you know, get a nice walk and enjoy nature while hearing the, you know, overwhelming chorus of cicadas all around you. Oh, God, sounds terrifying. Uh, we also have another question from Alfred uh, from Facebook, uh, who asked about being east of the Mississippi River, um, because, you know, not New York or California. Um, okay, yes. So, um, so most of them are east of the Mississippi, particularly the higher numbers. Um, there are plenty of other cicada species in other parts of the country. Um, I, I know at least one person contacted us and said they thought they'd found um, one of the, the shells out in California, but that's probably a different species of cicadas that they're just seeing out there as well. So other people have plenty of cicadas, but East of the Mississippi, we get lucky and get the uh, seventeen-year cicadas and the thirteen-year cicadas. Right. right there, there. How many? Uh, how many thousand uh, cicada species are there worldwide? It's uh, it's quite a, it, quite a few. It's a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. a big number. So there, they're right. There's so there are cicadas. Cicadas appear all over the world, but the periodical periodical cicadas those are specific to the northeastern U.S. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and. And we also have some other species of cicadas that um, that's another question we've been getting is that people say like, okay, like we get these every year. What's the big deal? Well, those are different species of cicadas. Those are our annual cicadas. Um, these are the 17 year cicadas. They're very different. And, and I think you mentioned this earlier in, um, in the presentation as well. Um, but th those get mixed up all the time. The, the annual cicadas tend to emerge later in the summer. They're green, um, whereas the periodical cicadas have these bright red eyes, dark bodies, um, golden wing veins, and they're emerging only once every 17 years um, or 13 year for the 13 year cicadas. And they're coming out earlier in the summer. And also, just depending on what part of the country you're in, you might be thinking, "Well, wait a minute! Didn't we have a, didn't we have like a brood come out just a couple of years ago?" And yes, that's very true, but it wasn't brood ten. Yes, right. So, right. There are there are, there are uh, there are um, how many how many different broods are there? There are so at one point there were four broods of thirteen year cicadas and thirteen broods of seventeen year cicadas, but. Each went extinct, so now we only have um, um, three active broods of 13 year cicadas and then 12 active broods of the 17 year cicadas. Right, so, so it's, it is possible that you saw a brood of periodical cicadas within the yes. last few years, but it wasn't brood 10. Yes, yes, definitely. Brood 10 is special. <laughs> brood 10. Uh, I mean, I think. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it's special because we get it here in Indiana, but I'm a little biased there. <laughs> sure. Uh, we have uh, Sharif from YouTube wondering how many cicadas are in D.C. So it's still east, but maybe not nearly as north. Oh, um, no, but Maryland, Maryland uh, has... Uh... They're pretty widespread in Maryland, and uh, mm -hmm. and I think you could yeah you could you could check the map to see where the distribution is in DC. Uh, it's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not not quite as not quite as dense there, but you should be. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've actually been seeing yeah. people posting uh, posting photos on Twitter and Facebook from DC, saying that they're seeing them. Maybe yeah, de definitely not as not as um, dense as in Indiana, but uh, but they're there. <laughs> oh man, yeah, look at that, Southern Pennsylvania. Ooh boy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I'm not going there. <laughs> the other, okay. the other. I was just going to say one quick thing to keep in mind when, when you're looking at the map too is um, those are individual reports. So the more people there are, the more reports of cicadas we're probably going to get. Uh, so if you live in a very um, not very populated part of, say, Indiana or one of the other states with Brood 10, we really want you to send in those reports to us because you might be one of the only people in your area getting those reports in. So your report is extra important. <laughs> And yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, get out, get out there and find these cicadas, not just, in yes. a, not just for your own education and your, you know, just your own, your own embracing science, but, but also just to help scientists, you know, know where the cicadas are. Yes. Yeah. Come okay. submit your pictures to, uh, to life science and freak me out. So I have to make <laughs> All right. I think we, I think we have time for, uh, for just, uh, one or two more questions. Um, let's see. Um, well, looks like our social media, uh, Diana, also loves cicada. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, cicadas so, for everyone. Yeah, no, I think you know you guys really covered a lot. Like it, it's you know every year again, but again, like Brew Ten is really special. So I really do appreciate you both speaking on this super disgusting topic to me. <laughs> um, but to everybody else that doesn't think they're disgusting, go out there, take your pictures. And and then yeah, comment on the map so that the scientists know. Then you know, we'll get we'll, we'll control these sooner or later. Yeah. <laughs> so again, yes, yeah, so if you're if you happen to be living someplace where uh, where unfortunately the cicadas are not showing up this year, you can uh, you can check out the cicada cam at the Discovery Channel and see a live feed through uh, through May thirtieth. And there is a uh, and that's that's on their Facebook page and uh, on their website, and we'll have the links for those here. Uh, if you want to learn more about cicadas or about the fungus that turns them into zombies, uh, then check out our reference page at Live Science uh, and also recent articles about Brood 10. Uh, we will put the links in the description on YouTube and Facebook after the mm -hmm. stream. And we want to see your photos and videos. So please, if you if you are someplace uh, if you are someplace where you're seeing Brood 10 cicadas, please share you know, share this information on uh, on the apps that Elizabeth mentioned earlier. That's uh, Cicada Cicada Safari and. Yep. Uh, and Cicada Inacola? Safari, yes. Okay. Yep. yep. So, so share share your photos. Uh, share your photos on those apps and share them with us. Put them uh, put them on on Twitter and Facebook. Use the hashtag BroodX, and uh, and tag us so we can see all your beautiful cicadas and maybe feature them uh, in a gallery on Live Science. So, uh, so Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us here today and for talking about Brood and cicadas. Oh, I'm happy to be here. I'm so excited that other people are excited about the cicadas. So excited. <laughs> so excited. That's that's what this face is. Cicadas. I'm cicadas right now. This is this is my cicada face. <laughs> well, thanks, guys, and uh, happy cicada hunting. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.